Hey guys, hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is Shitich and on this channel we talk about robotics, research and academia. Today's video is on a yet another very hot topic which is how to identify gaps in the literature or research gaps. So oftentimes when a new student or early stage researcher is starting out with research, they'd be asked to identify gaps in the literature. What are research gaps? So if you imagine this kind of a jigsaw piece of the puzzle, that is your research landscape. So imagine whatever domain you're in. So I'm in robotics, for example. So that's all the pieces of the puzzle that have been addressed in robotics. And my job as an early stage researcher is to identify gaps. So missing pieces of the block, which my thesis would eventually end up plugging. Right. So I want to find the missing pieces to make the puzzle complete. Of course, not everybody is going to be able to find all the missing pieces, which is why there are like researchers around the world working around the clock trying to solve uh, different problems or parts of the problems. Right. So that's a research gap and it's very important to identify the research gap. Why? It is essential to make sure that the problem you're about to go after is, is worth solving and you're not going at it just because it sounds cool to you. Research is not about cool things. It's about ideas worth solving, problems worth addressing. It needs to be made sure that the problem you're about to go after hasn't been solved already because if you're solving the same thing that anybody else has already done, you'll get this obvious question, right? So why did you waste your time? The problem was already solved by so-and-so method, by so-and-so person. So you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So that's why it's very important to identify a research gap. Otherwise, you'll end up finding a piece of the puzzle that was already there for you. And this normally happens after you've invested all your efforts and gone through the journey, and then it's too late. And typically, you'll have your ideas rejected, manuscripts rejected, thesis rejected, or worse. And you need to make sure that the research you're about to do is timely. So for example, now is the time of the pandemic. And if you contribute something that aids to this problem, it's a very timely research. But if you do this research, maybe some 40, 50 years down the line and say, okay, how could we have solved the problem of COVID that happened four centuries, four decades ago? That's a bit off topic and a bit, you're a bit too late to the party, right? So you have to understand that it needs to be timely it needs to be worth solving and it needs to be unsolved. And this is done by identifying the research gaps. Now, there are various types of research gaps that exist, and I have tried to categorize them into some of the things like I could think of. Uh, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there might be more, but this might give you some pointers on the aspects you should think about on what qualifies as a research gap. So first thing is an evidence gap, right? So imagine you want to make a claim or a conclusion in some aspect of your research. You've written down the statement. And as I said, research is not about something that's cool. It's an evidence-based study. So you need evidence to back up your claim. But you are struggling to find evidence for that statement or that claim you want to make. So there you have identified an evidence gap. You need to do more studies along those lines to find evidence to either support or refuse the claim that you're trying to make. If you can't find evidence supporting the claim, you would find counter evidence, which builds on from there onwards. So you've identified a gap, which is I like to call as an evidence gap. The next one is a knowledge gap, right? So it's some desired results that you would have hoped to exist, but they don't. And the knowledge does not explain the phenomena the, that the, the way you would like it to, right? So there is gap in the theory, the concept that is preventing you from being able to explain something. So it's a lack of knowledge. Then methodological gap is some research methods that are needed to obtain novel insights. So there is a particular way things are done. There's a method but you want to identify new methods that might reveal new learnings into something. Um, this could be also to do away with the problem of having skewed results, because if a problem is solved in one particular way, it always gives one particular result, which may not be the most optimal result. So if you change the way a problem is solved, you get new results, which would be better than the previous ones in some reference, such as they're no longer skewed, they are more statistically significant and so on and so forth. Next up is the contextual gap. So sometimes when this is very relevant to uh, kind of survey based studies that I find. 
So if somebody conducted a survey, for example, in a particular region of the world, a particular weather, a particular population, or so on and so forth, that's a very contextual setting, right? So whatever results are applicable to that context will not translate to a different context. If you have a valid reason to prove that the context you are thinking about is very relevant and the results are non-transferable, there you've identified a contextual gap. This might be relevant to other studies as well, but survey-based studies are a very intuitive example for something like this. Technological gap. So you see hardware and software around the world, there are new advances in it every once in a while, right? So there are new phones being released, new cameras being released, new software coming up, new tools coming up. So that leads, leads to a technological gap. So we have developed the technology at a slightly different pace from what we have done with the, with the methods. So you have identified like, you know, your method is up until here, but your technology is somewhere there or like this. So, you know, you want to increase the level of methods that match with the advancement in the technology as well. So there's a technology gap there. So these are just some of the, the kind of gaps that you could think about, right? But essentially what you're going after is identifying your research landscape like this and finding out missing piece of the puzzle. And then you kind of, um, kind of go for that piece of the puzzle and that becomes yours. That's why I have this flag for the whole, right? So it's like you scored for that and it becomes yours. Where to look for the gaps, right? Um, where, and the biggest problem, why this bothers most of the early stage researchers, because when I say look for a gap, I'm basically asking you to find something that doesn't exist. So remember here, I told you, look for something that doesn't exist, right? But it's very counterintuitive. How on earth do you look for something that doesn't exist? And if you don't even know how it looks like, right? So some of the common ways of how you can do it is to read papers. That's why literature review is very, very crucial for identifying the current trends, current gaps, and how you can contribute to filling them. So it's basically scoping your, your thesis, right? So in one of the previous videos, we talked about this literature review database, how to manage that, plan that, and grow that, right? So in there, there was a column of concept summary. Concept summary is essentially not just summarizing the, the paper that you have read in a couple of words. It's also identifying what were the gaps of the work of that particular work, if any. And that could be corresponding to any one of the categories we've just discussed or anything beyond that as well. So what was the gaps that were either filled or left out by that work? So you need to make like a concept summary of all of the papers that you read. And then, you know, you should put them in a blender and churn them and come up with the concept summary that kind of is like a meta summary of all the papers that you've read, right? So literature review is very, very essential because and especially when you're reading the papers, you should look for two areas in particular. So when you're reading the introduction or the abstract, they normally say the advancements over the state of the art and what was lacking back then. So before this work was contributed, that is a gap that they have spotted and filled, right? So you could take some inspiration from there. Also, they have left out some things to be done in the future. Future works are gaps that have been identified, but not filled yet. So that's an inspiration for you as well. Another thing is cross-referencing. Right. So you have read papers that have cited other papers and has given you the limitations of other papers, but the current paper that you're reading, how do you identify what is the problem with them if they haven't explained their limitations explicitly? This is what I like to call this cross referencing. Right. So you should kind of find the other papers that are citing this paper because they would have done the same thing what this paper did for the other papers. Right. So you found paper one that cites five other papers and say, what was the limitation there? But paper one was cited by other papers that say, what was the limitation of paper one? So this is like cross-referencing. And this is how you identify the limitations of the work. And then you keep populating the database accordingly. Survey papers are essentially a goldmine of knowledge. This was something I undervalued in the early stages of my research because I didn't quite understand what was the point of reading survey papers. Also, Survey papers are very lengthy, right? So normally the regular manuscripts have, let's say 20, 30 something references. Survey papers would have 10 times those amount of references, could be 200, 300 references sometimes, which means it's gonna be a very lengthy manuscript to read. And oftentimes uh, you can easily get bored and be put off by the length of the manuscript and you just completely ignore it. Don't make this mistake. Survey papers, as I said, are a gold mine of information because they have done the heavy lifting for you. They have assimilated the current papers, current recent advances, 
and have critically analyzed the current trends and have laid out the footprint for the future future trends right so this is what has been done in the past uh, whatever five years 10 years or so this is the, the problems that we are facing and these are some of the future directions that we can go for so they have essentially given you all the gaps that exist along those lines and you could take inspiration from there and try and see okay is there something that you could do to fill the gaps or is there one of those gaps or a couple of those gaps that are interesting for you right it is very essential for you to be interested in those gaps as well don't just try to go after the gap just because there is a gap it's unless there is interest you would lose energy and get burnt out so that's very important to keep in mind these are just a couple of pointers on where you could look for it but at the end of the day it all boils down to reading 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 and reading lots and lots of papers and populating that database with concept summary and then making a meta summary now <clears throat> i explained a couple of kind of types of gaps to identify what is a research gap and where to look for it so then everything is all right there is no further problem to look out for well that is not how it works because if that was really that simple you for one would not be watching this video and two everybody every early stage researcher would be having the time of their lives trying to come up with research ideas and doing it there is a reason why everybody struggles and what are those i call them pitfalls so first pitfall is getting the scope right so you've identified let's say a gap in the in the literature based on the papers you've read the problem is if the missing piece of the puzzle that you propose would fix this gap if it's too small it's no good if it's too big it's still no good now what does it mean too small means you've kept the scope of the problem so narrow that it won't match with the timeline you have so for instance if you're doing let's say a three year four year phd and you've come up with a scope so narrow that would probably be filled in like a one paper or so that's not good enough for your phd right it finishes a bit too soon also doesn't it still leaves out gaps around it. so it's not big enough yet and if the piece of the puzzle is too big let's say you come up with such an over ambitious problem statement that uh, or gap that takes about 10 years to solve you don't have that kind of time so it's no good to anybody anyways right so scoping is quite a challenging task and this is where people struggle the most early stage researchers don't have the practical wisdom to identify first of all what is a good gap and is the gap good enough to match the timeline of the thesis and this is why you need to kind of chat with your seniors and run the idea by them and have them validate it which brings me to the second pitfall wrong expectations from others i have often seen when the early stage researchers reach out to their seniors or fellows um they try to play 20 questions with them it's like trying to get the other person to serve the re the research gap to you which is the biggest mistake you could ever make it's synonymous to walking into a restaurant and the waiter trying to serve you the food without ever asking you your preferences there is high chance you're not going to like it the reason being lack of interest it does not come from your interest it comes from the other person's interest which may or may not align with yours and playing 20 questions is not the best way to to identify a research gap so do your own analysis like the database that we talked about prepare it fill it populate it analyze it and then come up with a research gap that you think is sensible then start talking to other people and presenting the research gaps to them to try and gain their feedback because they are more experienced in this area of, compared to you so give their feedback to try and understand if this research gap is too big too small or how could you improve right so maybe it's too uh, it needs a bit of work to polish it and that's where these people can help don't try to play 20 questions with them and have somebody else solve the problem for you it has to be you who's doing everything next up the quantity of papers soon becomes a distractor right so i've often seen early stage researchers get over excited when they have read a couple of papers let's say if you read 100 papers you feel like you've accomplished quite a lot right so you read 100 papers and you've seen your database grow but that's the wrong motivator to look for right it's a vanity metric as i call it the problem is if you've read 100 papers but you still have no idea how to summarize the 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 concept summary and identify that the research gaps from the papers you read all the literature that you have read so far is just superficial you have read the paper stand alone you have a very high level understanding of what that paper was doing but it doesn't kind of help you churn out and identify research gaps and how you are going to fill it you're still missing a big piece of the the literature review right that's why we say literature review should lead to identification of research gaps so you've only done half of the problem 
you've done the literature review, but you haven't identified the gaps, which is a pitfall. So don't fall for this. It's okay if you've read 100 papers, 200 papers, 300 papers, whatever. The number does not matter as long as you're able to identify the gaps. And the more you read, the more informed decisions you could make in identifying a good research gap. So read extensively. So that was all about, you know, um, what is a research gap, where you can find it, different types of those, some pitfalls to look out for. Now, what happens next? So two things. One is you're going to go back to this literature review database, which is uh, we have already talked about this in one of the previous videos, and you're going to start kind of populating it based on the papers you've read and write down the research gaps you've identified individually for each of the literature that you're reading and then make a meta summary of those. Then you're going to go to your senior researchers and fellows and start brainstorming, start asking them for feedback. And number three, so there were three things. Okay. So number three is identifying what you're going to do once you have a research gap, how are you going to fill it? That is going to come up in one of my next videos. So stay tuned and stick around for the next video. In the meantime, I hope you found this video helpful to kind of get to grips with what is a research gap, where to look for it, how to find the one that works for you and go after the right kind of research gaps, um, trying to demystify what a research gap really is. Be sure to like and share this video with other early stage researchers so that we could help out most people as this is something that becomes very frustrating very fast. It's like, as I already explained, going after the unknown is it's quite frustrating sometimes, right? So don't get frustrated, keep at it. But now you have like a proper line of thought. I never say I'm going to give you a recipe of how to do it and exactly the way to do it. These are just a couple of pointers to get you, your brain thinking in the right direction. Hope you found them useful. Be sure to subscribe my, to my channel so that you're notified as soon as the next video goes live. I hope you have a nice day.